Hello, I'm Margaret Eachin and I'm the National CEO of the Canadian Mental Health Association. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us to kick off CMHA's 71st Mental Health Week. Yes, you heard that right. CMHA has been hosting Mental Health Week for an incredible 71 years. And in that time, it's morphed from a campaign about raising awareness to a campaign for real social change. Our theme for this year is empathy. And we believe empathy has the power to change lives, to change our society, and to even change the world. Through the pandemic, I think Canadians have learned to feel more empathy for those who struggle with their mental health. And it's my wish that that empathy and the great need we've experienced for mental health services will translate into more support for mental health care. Empathy could be the game changer. So today we've gathered a panel of mental health champions to share our experiences, ideas, and stories about the power of empathy. I want to thank the CMHA branches in Ontario who organized this national event to kick off a great week. Thank you so very much. And now I'd like to introduce you to our MC for today, Nick Petrella. Nick is a professor and first year coordinator for the health, wellness and fitness program at Mohawk College in Hamilton, Ontario. He's also a strength and conditioning coach, mental health first aid instructor with CMHA and a mental health advocate. In his spare time, he's a keynote speaker working to break the stigma associated with mental illness in the world. Please welcome Nick. Awesome, thank you, Margaret. And, and thank you everybody for, for joining us today and for being here and participating in this uh, Mental Health Week, especially around such an important topic. To begin, I'd like to take a moment to start today off with acknowledging the land in which we gather. As we gather, we are all reminded that we are meeting on lands that are the original lands occupied by Indigenous people for thousands of years before colonization, that are steeped in rich Indigenous history and traditions. We have a responsibility to carry forward the Indigenous stewardship of the land, water, and air, and that we may preserve it for future generations. We recognize the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples and commit to the Truth and Recon Reconciliation Report, supporting the 94 calls to action by honoring the truth and reconciling for the future. I'd like to welcome Jean-Bierre de Rocher from CMHA Champlain East to share this acknowledgement with you in French. Jean-Bierre has not been able to make it. If you'd like to move on, Nick, sorry about that. No, it's okay, thank you. So carrying on, sometimes talking about our mental health can be tough and it can be difficult bringing up a lot of uncomfortable feelings. If you feel at any time that you need support, please keep talking. Reach out to your local crisis line or Crisis Canada, which is being shared in the chat now. And as I mentioned, everybody right before, at some point my dogs will bark, so there's their first introduction. It's my honor to now introduce our panelists. First, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau. Sophie is a mother of three, a mental health advocate, and a yoga teacher. Sophie is an award-winning humanitarian who brings her passion and commitment to the role of CMHA national volunteer. She is an engaged advocate for many causes, including women's and girls' rights, gender equality, mental health, and self-esteem. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us today, Sophie. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. And next, please welcome Michael Landsberg. Michael is an ambassador for Bell Let's Talk, an initiative raising awareness about mental health and the founder of Sick Not Weak, a charity that reframes mental illness as a health issue rather, rather than a character flaw. Michael is also one of the best known personalities in Canadian broadcasting, having been with TSN since its inception. He hosted Off the Record from 1997 to its finale in 2015 and is currently the co-host of TSN's First Up. Thank you, Michael, for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me. Do you hear that? No, you don't. My dog is quiet, very quiet. Good job, Riggs. <laughs> Applause to that. I don't know how you do that. And, and finally, please join me in welcoming Kayla Brelove Carter. As a clinical traumatologist, Kayla works with individuals and organizations to increase their awareness and understanding of trauma, 
racial trauma, and adverse childhood experiences. When she is not providing counseling therapy or consultation work, Kayla enjoys contributing to CBC Morning Moncton and PEI as their mental health columnist. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you again to everybody for joining us today in this important conversation. Empathy is such a, an interesting topic, but as I often say, it's really misunderstood in a lot of ways. So I think this is a perfect way to start off Mental Health Week. And I'm gonna start off by, by offering up a question to Sophie. So Sophie, how would you define empathy? You know, I think, um, I think it's a big word in the sense that we, we, we're not born with empathy. It's like resilience. We can develop empathy and we can develop resilience. And for me, when I hear the word empathy, I think witnessing. As human beings, we're so bombarded with information and emotions, and we're so hungry for connection and authenticity that empathy allows us to witness our own lives, to become a witness to our own situation. Without empathy, we don't really understand why we're feeling the way we're feeling. And if we don't understand that in ourselves, it's very difficult to offer it to other people. And, you know, even as a type A personality, sometimes I'll be listening to somebody um, telling me a story and I'm a super sensitive person and I just, I just want to help. So I have this kind of go to to try to you know find a solution and say well i maybe i can help you this way or that way when really um empathy is first of all not only feeling and understanding the other human beside you or humans but also putting yourself into their place and trying to listen deeply in silence so empathy for me also equals uh silence i think that the only way we can gain perspective and um develop our resilience and and be a witness to our own lives with with observation qualities observa observational qualities we need to be able to sit in silence and that's one thing that's really tough to do in our society so i think it's all part of this big conversation that we're having today yeah absolutely i totally agree and i love the word perspective because i think that adds a whole new dimension to what empathy is because empathy is developed with perspective right and, and perspective comes from experience uh, Michael, I'll turn that question over to you. How do you define empathy? Yeah, I, I kind of think there's a visual aspect because I, I was listening to Sophie and I was doing this like, yeah, you know, uh, and when she talked about listening, I think that that is the one element that goes into empathy that does not go into sympathy, for instance, you know, like there's these three words that I have all my life confused, but in preparing for this, I, I think I kind of figured them out. There's sympathy, there's empathy, and there's compassion. And sympathy, without a doubt, is when you care, when you're sensitive, when you're kind, you're sincere, you're selfless. But one thing is missing from that that you need, I think, to be empathetic. And that is either understanding or the desire to understand. And that is a huge thing when it comes to mental illness, for instance. Um, the, the one thing that I talk about all the time is the power of knowing that somebody understands you. Uh, I also have contended that if you don't understand or if you haven't been through something like depression, you can't understand it. So how can you be empathetic to that person uh, that you want to offer all you have to make them feel better? And if you can't understand it, the next best thing is to say, help me try to understand. Because, you know, sometimes when, when you say, oh, I know how you feel, that kind of that can be really condescending and that can be really minimizing someone's illness because you probably don't. So I think empathy is, is the act of trying to understand, trying to really understand what somebody is saying. And you can't do that by talking. You can do it by asking questions, but you can't necessarily do it by offering your opinion. The simple act of, okay, well, you know, I know you're going through a really hard time. I know that it's really hard for you to get out of bed. Tell me, tell me what that's like. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with that 100% as well. And it's, I think it's almost human nature where we want to fix things, right? So our, our nature is to offer solutions or, or offer advice, or try to make people feel better. Whereas empathy isn't necessarily trying to make someone feel better. It's more so just trying to understand the emotion that's associated. That's great. Thank you. Um, Kayla, over to you. Same thing. What is empathy? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I echo uh, both Sophia and, and Michael while also adding just this perspective that it's really about a person that's able to step into another person's shoes and see from their perspective. So I think we've echoed a lot around, around perspective here. It, it also gives us hope and meaning, and it helps us to a certain point where we're able to hold that space for one another to solve problems. And it allows us to be able to live more authentically and healthier. Uh, so one of the, I guess, one of the words that come up for me is, is also safety. Um, when we're able to meet people where they're at and really um, take into the perspective of what their sufferance and their pain may be, um, it's in a safe way. It's, it's allowing us to have that vulnerability between uh, human beings and human interaction. Yeah, that's a great word too. I've never actually thought about it that way. That's awesome. And, and that safety really makes people feel that they're able to share or feel like that there's an alliance built, right? And that alliance, I think, is what empathy is. It's that ability to create that conversation and keep that line of communication open as well. So almost like a follow-up question, I guess, in some way. Um, this one going um, over to, to Michael. Can you share, share with us a time that someone showed you emp empathy and the impact that that had on you and how it made you feel? Yeah, I think I, I, I think I learned so much from one of the few times in my life that someone's actually shown me empathy. And that's not because I'm not surrounded by amazing people. Uh, it's because I very seldom expose myself to the point where it looks like I need somebody's empathy. Uh, I have spent the last 10 years of my life trying to show empathy to others. One of the toughest things for me to do is to not talk. And we've just established the fact that real good empathy comes from listening more than it does from talking. But I remember, uh, well, when I was the young, the youngest that I can imagine, uh, my earliest memories are, are me having anxiety. And not just anxiety like um, worrying about things that had logical consequences, right? You know, worrying about an exam is not anxiety, the illness. You know, worrying about going to the doctor is not anxiety, the illness. It's, it's this feeling of like your heightened sense of this sense of doom. Uh, and I lived with that for uh, most of the first part of my life. Uh, and I had things that I was afraid of that I never shared with another soul. Uh, and then um, fast forward to like 20 years ago when I realized for the first time, this, this was kind of me. Oh my God, I, have, I, I just figured this out. I have depression. And this is unimaginably painful for me. Uh, I had no idea. I wanted to go around and apologize to everyone that I'd ever judged by uh, who, you know, people that said, oh, you know, I have to take time off work or I had a breakdown. I thought like everybody else, and I bought into the stigma that that was weakness. But I was so debilitated by this and so devastated by this. Uh, what helped me come to grips with it though, was actually my brother. Uh, we are four years apart. We grew up very close. My brother became a kidney doctor. Uh, he, um, he started drinking when he was 16. Uh, later on in his life, he found out that he was self-medicating from exactly what I had been going through. But we never spoke about it because I had no idea that I had a mental illness because I never lived in anybody else's head. And he never talked about it. He just self-medicated. And then when he said to me, when I told him, you know, I'm like really struggling here and I, I'm going to need to go on medication and I'm going to need to do this and that, he said, oh my gosh. I'm so sorry, sympathy. He said, I'm so sorry because I've been through it and I understand how painful it is, empathy. And that was for me a huge step, not just in getting help because I was gonna go for help, but this feeling that you're not the only one. And I think that all of us with depression and anxiety feel like we're the only ones, right? It's like, no, nobody else has this. But then when you find out that someone has exactly that, immediately you feel less alone. And I felt less like a loser, so to speak, um, which I have come to realize uh, is something many of us feel. But my brother uh, showing me uh, that empathy um, made a big difference to me. Yeah, and you're right. There's such a notable difference between sympathy and empathy in terms of how you feel after that conversation, right? Like you just said, you feel different. You feel better. You feel that people approve of you when, when there's empathy involved versus sympathy. It's kind of like, okay, well, maybe you don't understand and maybe I should stop talking now. Uh, yeah. Kayla, over to you. Sorry, go ahead, Michael. I didn't mean to cut you off there. 
Yeah. Um, well, I actually cut you off, but hey, <laughs> uh, I think also it makes you feel validated. You know, empathy makes you feel sympathy doesn't make you feel validated because someone says, I'm sorry, but that's not the same as I understand or I'm trying to understand. And validation is very important for people with mental illness because we can't prove it, right? Like you can't show someone, you know, your scar from the surgery or an x-ray or a biopsy. So it's all what people believe and what you believe. So, um, you know, that feeling of being understood is huge. I agree 100%. And I have a similar background to you, Michael, being diagnosed with anxiety and depression, having I, different, I didn't have any idea what the heck that was. I had to, to read on the internet what that meant and, and what the options were for me. And, you know, when I was diagnosed, you didn't really have that, uh, those polite, you know, uh, website results and searches. It was more along the lines of, of the negative. So the validation is huge and being validated is a huge component of empathy. Um, Kayla, uh, over to you in, in a little bit of a variation of the question. Hearing these stories um, obviously makes me wonder how experiencing empathy or not can impact your mental health. Can you comment on that? Yeah. When we have empathy in our lives, it helps us not only to create and maintain an initiative, like supportive and interpersonal relationship, it also helps us to feel empowered, to learn effective ways to be well within our environments as well of our experiences. Empathy helps us to feel safe. So when we feel safe, then we are able to create more room to live authentically. Safety has four pillars. A lot of times people think like, okay, well, I, I, I am safe, but we're not just talking about physical safety. We're also talking about social safety. How safe do I feel with the people that surround me? Are they holding that space? Are they validating? Are they acknowledging? Are they respecting my boundaries? Uh, when we think about psychological safety, how safe do I feel with how I speak to myself and about myself? And then moral safety, how safe do I feel of being able to live based upon my values? So when we have lack of empathy, that can really create a lot of unresolved issues. It minimizes empathy significant, right? So it often leads us to self-judgment and unresolved grief. While we give ourselves self-compassion, it offers that opportunity to increase our empathy. We give ourselves permission to just be, to be authentic to ourselves. That sort of, that would be my, my point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, and the authenticity piece is very, very big. Um, feeling like you can be yourself and not wear a, you know, wear a mask or, or pretend that you're okay and pretend that you know, you're having a good day when you're not being able to be authentic and honest, not only with yourself, but the people you're closest to are, it's so important. And oftentimes, you know, doing presentations in these webinars and, and just having these conversations, a lot of times the question comes up, people find it difficult to reach out for help. They don't know how to reach out for help, A, um, and B, they don't really know what to say because most of the time, the people that love us the most, they just wanna try and fix it. They just wanna try and take that pain away or, or you know, give you some advice to try and make it better you know, instantly, you know, that instant fix type thing, that light switch. So Kayla, a, another follow-up question, I guess. Why do you think it can be difficult for people to show empathy when sitting with someone who is struggling? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's a quite complex question. So I'll, I'll do my best to, to try to explain it. So it, it is difficult for people to show empathy at times uh, when they're witnessing someone who's struggling because some of the most difficult things to recognize and address is also the conversation around privilege. And privilege really prevents us to have true empathy. We can consciously talk about privilege as an advantage or a right to belong to a person simply by, let's say, their birthright, being born in a certain class or a certain race, ethnicity, gender, or other spaces in life. However, when we reflect on the idea that we have privilege and that privilege plays a role in, let's say, the sufferance and pain of others, then that's where it becomes really difficult for most. And, and it is also a subconscious thing. So even becoming aware of it is a huge challenge. While when we think about empathy in this context, we can generally agree that empathy is an interaction between two people with one person really feeling what the other person is experiencing. But how do we do this, right? When some don't share the same privilege and others then are viewed as privileged. 
when we take a courageous step in reflecting on our own lived experiences and we begin to evaluate our achievements, uh, we have to acknowledge that this is not just a personal effort, but also a blend of hard work and unearned advantages. So not all privilege is the same. Consider what life is like for members of one particular group that's different from our own. When we shift our attention from a focus solely on the information that's presented of like, oh, I need to fix it, or I'm not sure how to reach out, to concentrate more on what people are actually experiencing, we then go beyond thinking by integrating the whole person, the thoughts, as well as the feelings. And this is really, really hard because we live in a society, unfortunately, that encourages individualism. We are overtly preoccupied with our own experiences. And even when that might not directly um, impact us. So if we're seeing something or, or hearing about something. So when we participate in experiencing that engages emotions as well as thought, empathy can occur offering the opportunity to step outside of ourselves and to view our own advantages or disadvantages compared to others with empathy and compassion. Um, so it is quite complex because it's asking us to really recognize something that is very subconscious and that we all hold, um, but we need to be able to do so in a safe way. So that's what I would say uh, as to why it might be difficult for some people to be able to see other people's empathy yeah yeah that's really 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 well said i think you know one thing i took from that is too is it's almost like being you have to be present as well right in order to be uh, to to be empathetic or, or practice empathy you have to be present in the moment and we live in such a fast-paced environment where we're always thinking about what's next you know what when's my next time commitment uh do i have a meeting what's going on so it forces us always to be trying to be ahead of uh, ahead of the game a little bit um, Sophie, I'm going to move it on to you. Um, same question. Why do you think it can be difficult for people to show empathy? Well, you know, if you eat 20 donuts a day and, and 20 Big Macs, you will see an impact on your health, on your physical health. Um, we become what we consume. And so if we consume information that constantly reminds us of our own importance in the world, and we forget what's happening around us, we become that person. So what we consume as, as citizens is extremely important. And this comes back to education, education, and education. Unbiased education, truth facing um, in, from a very young age in our society, in, a, in an enriching and diverse population of a country like we have, there is no excuse for us to not tackle the reality that so many people are going through every day. You know, there's, there's so much going on at different levels, and, and you put it so well, Kayla, because, you know, sometimes you'll hear new expressions like um, affluent depression affluent abuse. Then we talk about, uh, you know, underprivileged, underserved communities. Um, there's so many new words in our vocabulary, in our language that carry so much weight and symbolism. And these words, they matter. So if you're an individual who surrounds yourself with most people who think like you, you know, and, and keep either a narrow, a wide, a high, a little view of, of the world around you, well, it comes to no surprise that we become what we consume. So first of all, I think that we have to watch and be very mindful of what we put into our bodies, but also what we put into our minds, because you can't develop empathy if you're not connected to, to other people around you. So that's the first thing. And also, I come from... Um, a home where there was depression and addiction and I'm an only child so very early I had lots of pressure to try to save a lot of people um, in, in my own household and that weight and that fear and that lack of control transformed into an eating disorder and I was diagnosed um, in my late teens and the empathy that I got from my mother the night where I was in bed and I decided to share my story and it came out, it doesn't matter how it comes out, as long as you share your story, you will find an ally on the way. And for me, that was the biggest lesson. There are some 
people who do not develop empathy, but that doesn't mean that there are people who, who will never develop it. You'll always find an, an empathetic ally on the way. You just have to, you know, open up, trust your intuition and take that tiny leap of telling your story, which is a giant step onto the healing process. So for me, um, it's really about education and about giving people a chance. You know, we celebrate our senses. We celebrate our capacity to, to see, to hear, to taste, to touch. What am I missing? <laughs> to smell. Um, but do we celebrate our capacity to feel? This is almost like a new language. And I have chills just talking about it because this conversation wasn't happening 20 years ago. Like, it wasn't. So we are witnessing something extraordinary where there are so many cracks in our system that allowed for, like Leonard Cohen says, for the light to come in. And it's allowing us to build stronger conversations, more authentic conversations, and facing our truth, which is honestly, I think, the most difficult thing that a human being can do on an individual level and as a society. It hurts. It can piss you off. Sorry for the expression. And it can make you angry. But once we know that, we can fix it together. So for me, the, a conversation like today gives me so much energy and so much joy and hope because most people are good, just so we know. <laughs> you know, as somebody who's on the political path uh, indirectly, sometimes it's easy to be disillusioned by, by a human goodness in the world. But no, most people are good and an empathetic path is possible. Sophie, thank you for, for sharing your story. It made me, you know, really realize that like you said all people most people are good and just because somebody doesn't know how to be empathetic to a situation doesn't mean they don't care and that's something we try and teach in mental health first aid as well like for example your parents you know they they, they may love you with everything they have they just may not know how to be empathetic to the situation so it's it's not necessarily that somebody doesn't care it just they just don't know how to respond in that moment or at all for that matter or may never know but that doesn't mean they don't care. Uh, Michael, uh, same question over to you uh, about empathy. Why do you think it might be hard for some people to show it? Well, when I was, uh, when I was looking through uh, all kinds of different articles and things, uh, I, I started off by uh, Googling the definition of, uh, of empathy. And there's tons of different ways that you can define it. But what I noticed was that every single one actually had the word understanding in it. And I think it's really difficult for people to be empathetic to someone who has something that they don't understand. And as I said before, uh, mental illness is impossible to understand if you haven't been through it. So it's like empathy can come really easily for some things, right? Like someone says to you, uh, you know, I, I, I can't uh, come into work today. I have the stomach flu. Well, everybody's had the stomach flu. So you could go, oh my gosh, I, oh God, I hate that. Oh, it's so, you know, it's so terrible. And I'm sorry that you have that. And man, you must be really, really, um, really struggling because that can be awful. But then if you go all the way through the different scenarios that you could possibly face to show empathy at the end is when someone says, you know, I battle depression. I have suicidal thoughts. Uh, that is incredibly difficult to be empathetic towards that person uh, if you have not been through it. So I think there's a barrier that exists that you got to try to break down. And I agree with Sophie. Most people are good. Most people want to do good. But we need to learn how to show empathy. It's not natural. Sympathy comes easily. You know, sympathy is to look at uh, somebody. Um, I somebody used the expression before about you know walking in somebody else's shoes. You know, sympathy would be to me. You look at somebody and you say, "Oh, uh, you know, I'm I'm sorry. Your shoes have holes in them. I feel terrible about that." Empathy would be, uh, I can only imagine what it's like to have holes in your shoes and walk around and it's painful. And then, you know, the saying, I walk a mile in my shoes. And then there's, uh, I guess, the third thing, which would be um, the ultimate in compassion, which is uh, buying somebody new shoes who needs new shoes. So I think that these are all three different separate things. One comes really easily, sympathy and empathy, I think comes a lot more difficult. It is hard to understand what to say to somebody who's really hurting. And it's like, I want to do what's best for them. I want to offer something more than I'm sorry. But that's really hard if you don't understand. And this area of mental illness in particular, I think, um, for those that have never been through it, is the most difficult 
to be empathetic towards is a person with this with this silent invisible illness so i i think it's uh committing to learn how to be empathetic at best yeah absolutely and and judgment is something that we all can't avoid right it's something that's happening happening subconsciously in our brain every second and it's something that we can try to learn how to set aside but it's always there and that kind of leads into the next question uh and kayla we'll turn it over to you do you think that empathy can be learned? And if so, maybe a couple of tips on, on how somebody can learn to be a little bit better in their, their ways of empathy. Yeah, sure. I'll start off with a little bit of science, I think. So, you know, when we experience precursors for empathy as newborns, such as, you know, when a newborn hears another newborn crying, they become distressed. Uh, infants feel concerned for others, but still have difficulties regulating their own emotions. Toddlers develop empathy in sharing and apologizing and helping others. In early childhood, kids start to imagine how others feel. As we grow up, empathy develops more, right? So we do this through examining our biases, becoming curious about others' experiences, and also asking for feedback on how we impact others. For all of this to really transpire, to manifest, we need to feel safe. We need to feel safe enough to explore our authentic selves and to be vulnerable enough in sharing spaces with other people. If our environments don't nurture a type of reality that offers us opportunities to develop empathy, it gets harder to empathize because empathy is already a really difficult and complex thing to do because it's a very intentional and, and as we talked about being really mindful about it. We may struggle with active listening or offering empathetic statements or in resolving conflict and most prevalent in our societies today, lacking empathy for the earth and all of its inhabitants, both human and non-human alike. So empathy can really be modeled by realizing that it is needed in situations of sufferance and pain. Whether you or another person is suffering Empathy drives us to make changes. Instead of asking why about such suffering, you start to ask how you can move through it, right, in a safe way. Empathy isn't always easy, though, right? Sometimes it can lead to burnout or codependency. So empathy with intent is realizing that you can't save everyone, but you can hold space for them. It's showing up for another. It's finding common humanity so that we can all heal together. So to me, that's really how empathy can be taught um, and sort of the how to. It's about first asking the questions around what capacity do you have for yourself and what kind of reflections have you done in terms of how your environment nurtures or doesn't nurture empathy and how safe do you feel of creating space to lean into those feelings and to really, you know, think about how can I start moving through this instead of trying to fix it or saying like, oh, it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, very, very helpful. And I think uh, you brought up a lot of good points there. And, and, you know, it also kind of adds to the idea of why some people may not uh, be able to experience empathy. And it's, it forces us to feel, right? It, it, it makes us feel. And a lot of times we don't want to process emotion and we don't want to allow ourselves to process emotion because it hurts and it sucks. So I don't want to do that. Why would I do that? And then make myself not feel good in order to be, you know, to, to, to practice empathy on somebody else. Um, Sophie, I'm going to move it over to you and, and give us your thoughts on can empathy be learned? And if so, how? What you just said, Nick, right now, like suffering sucks. Um, you know, it's funny because I've heard this expression when I, when I do a hard yoga class, embrace the suck. <laughs> because in a way, um, I say that for my eating disorder, and obviously everybody's experience can be different, but in a way, it is very human to suffer. There's nothing wrong with suffering per se. What you do with your suffering and how you deal with your suffering is very important, but suffering in itself is actually a tool to dig deeper into who you are and to see, okay, what's happening? Like when, when you think like a, on a daily basis, uh, you know, it is said that we, we can't save what we don't understand. So if we don't understand ourselves, how can we say, uh, save ourselves? If we don't understand how the ecosystem of 
of uh, you know temperature and weather patterns across the the uh, the oceans work, we'll never want to save the environment. So I think again, education at a young age is absolutely key. But you know, you got to meet people where they are, and I think this is quite a lesson that I'm learning on my path. That I'm and I'm only 47, but you can't expect people to be emotionally where you are and that it's going to be easy to meet people suffering and relationships are hard but they are a gift they are a gift of what it means to actually to actually be human and i often say that we're all one trauma away from one another when you think about it it takes one traumatic life event whether it's an accident you lose a loved one whatever your story is so the person that you see on the street, and when, when, as a mother, when I'm talking to my children or, or more, you know, you can do blah, 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 blah with your kids, but it's really actions as a parent for me that I, that I really realize that speak the most. So when I'm walking down the street or when I'm running errands or when I see people who are suffering around me, I tend to tell my kids, hey, listen, this could be us. This could be you, my love, because it takes one bad luck in someone's life for either your brain to be changed your, your, your body to incorporate trauma and not knowing how to deal with it. You're very lucky. You're loved. You have support. You're understood. And I try to be, uh, you know, to have sympathy, compassion, and empathy for your own feelings. But we are all linked through our st stories of suffering. So it's, again, it's good news because you said it that way, Kayla. You said we must heal together. And although healing is a very personal path, when you are raised thinking that every human being that you meet contributes to your development, whether it was a good encounter or a bad encounter, when it's time to give back and to listen, it comes more naturally. When you are taught that huh, you build your own success, you're responsible for everything you've done in your life and that most people aren't really included because you, know, you had a lot of negative forces in your life, I think that's a dangerous way of thinking because every single human you encounter is a gift for you to grow as a wiser person. You decide how to react. So healing together, I think is key because although, you know, to, to surmount uh, the obstacles of what it means to suffer on a mental health level, the individual has to be, you have to be, I have to be invested in the process. And real change only happens when people are actually engaging in the process. But you're never alone and you shouldn't be doing this alone. So being doing this together, I think will deepen the empathy that we can develop in our own respective selves. Yeah, very well said. And, and to kind of summarize some of what you said there, I think we all want things to be easy, but one thing that I find that I say to, to my students and athletes all the time, uh, don't expect it to be easy. You know, it, recovery, healing, it's hard and it should be hard, right? Uh, managing your mental health, you know, whatever, whatever challenges you have. And I've almost kind of developed this philosophy where if something's going easy, I'm starting to prepare myself for the challenge that's coming because it really shouldn't be easy. It's not supposed to be easy. And if it comes easy, maybe it's not really worth achieving. So it's finding ways, methods to, to continue to grow, continue to develop and overcome obstacles. Uh, Michael, over to you and, and any final thoughts on uh, whether empathy can be learned and if so, how? I think it, it can be learned for sure. Uh, I think we, uh, or I should try to really apply it to mental health because that's why we're here, right? We're talking about mental health and we're talking how empathy relates to it. And I, I think it's hugely important to be truly empathetic to someone. Uh, if you have had the experience that um, a few of us on, on, this, uh, on this Zoom uh, chat have had, I think it's really important to share to the greatest ability you have and to go deeper and more raw than you've ever been, because that's what people really feel like um, when they're understood. And I think that's what you're trying to create in people. And I think that, uh, I mean, loneliness, for instance, uh, is a symptom that uh, almost all of us experience with mental illness. Uh, and, and you can be lonely when you're surrounded by hundreds of people. Uh, but if you find one person that understands you, 
that can change everything. So for me, empathy starts with really, um, you know, sharing to the best of my ability what this illness, depression and anxiety, what they feel like to me. So I, I say this quite often, uh, you know, loneliness is not about the number of people around you, but finding one who understands you. Uh, and those of us that have been through this can be that person. Uh, you know, also uh, you, I encourage people to do that because you get to use the worst thing in your life, which for many of us is our mental illness, as one of the best things in our life. It's like, okay, well, you know, I have this poison uh, called depression and anxiety, but I get to use it as somebody else's medicine because just me talking about it can make a difference. And that is a situation where being empathetic can actually make you feel better. The more you share, the more you take. It's a weird thing how rewarding it is. Um, you know, to share what you're going through. And uh, Nick, you mentioned something. I made up a list before of uh, different things that um, you need to, uh, to learn how uh, or things that you need to learn that are really important um, to being empathetic. And you used one that I liked, and that was no judgment. Very difficult to be empathetic if you're judging. And it's, uh, you know, very easy for some people to judge. Sometimes that's our first instinct. Uh, and when it comes to mental health, if you are judging, um, then you cease to be of use to this person that you, in theory, want to help. Being genuine, as I just talked about, is hugely important. Being fully present with others. And by fully present, I mean actively listening. I remember the first time I went to a therapist, uh, I, I was talking. And he was doing this, like, like I, he was like nodding or giving reaction to everything. And I said, whoa, whoa, this is very distracting here. Like, I understand you want to show me that you're engaged with me and that's great, but you know, just tone it back a little bit. But I think you can show people that you're actually listening to them, not just hearing the words, but embracing the words. Uh, I think that it's great advice to say less advice and more questions. The whole act of asking people, I think, is an empathetic act. Uh, I think it's first person, not third person, um, to say um, we, I think, is really, really important. Um, and not to refer to somebody as, well, you know, I know you're struggling. But as soon as you put it in the context of we, it becomes hugely more powerful for somebody. And again, we're talking about talking and sharing with somebody who has a mental illness, and so do you. Uh, and I think it's really important to say to people, like, hey, I, I can see this from your perspective, um, because we need to hear that sometimes, this feeling that, oh, my gosh, you know, no one can understand why I'm acting the way I'm acting. Uh, and it can be liberating to hear somebody say, you know, I can see that from your perspective. So I think we can learn to be empathetic. Uh, and I think it all comes easily if we want to be empathetic. So um, the desire to be that um, then paves the way for the ability to do that. Absolutely. And, and you brought up listening and, and, you know, we're not really taught how to listen. You know, that's not something that's a, a subject in school, right? Lear learning how to listen. It's something that we develop over time and with experience. And to put it that into a little bit of perspective, I'm sure we all have that friend that asks you how their weekend was so that they could tell you about their weekend, not because they care how your weekend was, but just because they need to tell you how theirs went, right? So it's asking questions and, and listening to the answer without the intent of answering your own question, right? So it's, it's, it's listening, listening involves asking questions and it's not so much about your voice or, or you speaking, it's about what they have to say and trying to understand that feeling. And I feel like we could probably talk for about two, maybe three more hours based on the conversation we're having right now. But I do want to, uh, to turn it over to any of the audience questions that came in. So there have been so many uh, trying to filter through and, and get through a couple of them, couple of them in the next 10 minutes here. Um, and one specifically uh, to Kayla. Kayla, you had mentioned that there are four pillars of safety. Uh, the audience would like you to list those again, please. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about safety, we're really thinking about these four pillars. So your first pillar, and is probably the one that most people know about is the physical safety. And I often tell uh, individuals that I work with that by the time you really experience that physical safety, you're not feeling physically safe, all the other three pillars have already been um, impacted. So your second one is psychological safety. So it's really about how safe you feel with yourself. And when I mean by that, I really mean about how safe do you feel with how you think of yourself? and how you speak about yourself. So 
are you using words that are self-compassionate or is there a lot of judgment there? Um, is there a lot of self-criticism? Or is there where you're embracing that sufferance and pain and leaning into it and just really experiencing that? that. Um, then you have social safety. And social safety is really about how safe you feel with the people that are around you. And that can be difficult sometimes because sometimes you may think that you are in a safe space, um, but then when you start setting boundaries or you make efforts to assert yourself or to just make space to say, hi, I'm here and not feeling that reciprocated, Oftentimes that could lead us to feeling um, socially unsafe or if people are violating our boundaries, et cetera. Then you have your fourth one, which is moral safety. This is all about values. And one of the toughest things about values oftentimes when I talk to people is, do you even <laughs> like, do you know what your values are? So on that front, it's an entire you know, journey and exploring what are my values and how safe do I feel being able to honor those values and really live by, you know, the the compass of what my values have to bring uh, throughout my life. So I hope that that's helpful. So it's the four, physical, psychological, social, and moral. Awesome, thank you so much. Another audience question and this one directed at Sophie. You talked a little bit about um, how we've come so far and, and you know, we didn't have these conversations 10, 20 years ago and here we are you know, on a global scale talking about empathy and what we can do. So the question is more around as a greater community, what do you think we, what are some things we can do to increase empathy? That's a beautiful question. And it, it, there's so much baggage to, uh, to unpack. Um, I think that uh, the more we tackle difficult subjects, I talked about truth facing a little bit earlier on, um, is very lucrative emotionally. Um, I think that you know, whether it's relationships, our concepts of success and failure. Um, you know, we still live in a society where it seems that, you know, marriage equals success, success divorce equals failure. Um, su success is when you, you make money, failure is when you don't. Like, we're still so stuck in um, old, patriarchal, uh, economy-driven, um, stuck, narrow models that hurt us in the way we perceive ourselves and in our daily relationships. And those need to be not only re-questioned, but they need to be discussed. They are difficult to tackle because they're so ingrained in our definitions of what it means to thrive during a lifetime or to not thrive. And they are cultural differences that need to be taken into account. The word intersectionality here is important because people react and interact in different ways depending on how they are treated by a society, the history behind their communities, uh, and the list goes on. So I think that I will reiterate the fact that the most difficult topics that we can discuss will really pay off on what we can learn from each other in the end. So, you know, whether you look right now, what's going on, I saw a couple of comments on the bottom of the screen during the, while we were talking, you know, about um, Atlas of the Heart, the book that Brene Brown, for example, wrote, and, and the roadmap to our own emotions, or Esther Perel, redefining relationships and fidelity. What does it really mean? How do we perceive ourselves in relationships? We need to be tackling you know, difficult issues where some people won't interpret them because of cultural standards and cultural um, uh, beliefs, religious beliefs, whatever it is. And we live in a country where it's pretty diverse. So these conversations are not only difficult to have, but I think they can be, above all, extremely enriching. We just need to be, uh, you know, standing together to be able to face our truths. Absolutely. And, and those real conversations, those authentic conversations, not accepting the answers of, you know, if you ask your friend how they are and they say, fine, well, when you know full and well that things aren't well, you accept that answer and you move on because you don't want to have that difficult conversation, right? So it's almost, you know, in establishing those relationships where it's okay to have real conversation and not just the fluff on the exterior that allows us to get, you know, get from, from sentence to sentence, so to speak. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael, there's a question for you here. 
Um, and you did uh, start to talk a lot about empathy, but as a father, how do you teach your son empathy and how can we create more empathic men in a society that doesn't traditionally value it? I, I think the best way to teach anything is to um, teach by example. Uh, and I think that my kids, uh, my son and my daughter have seen me um, try to practice what it is we're all talking about today. And I, I think that what I've tried to do is to try to instill in my kids the joy that giving brings you and that being empathetic to others, and in particular with mental health, but being empathetic to others in any way has a huge value for you. So it, like, it, it's, it's funny because it seems like it's the most unselfish thing in the world, you know, to be sympathetic and empathetic towards someone. But there is a selfish side to it, not bad selfish, but there's a side to it, which makes you feel better. You draw something out of it. So I've tried to show my kids the value of that um, for others and for yourself. Uh, and I've tried to do it, I think, you know, by, by doing what I try to do all the time, which is to use this, um, this experience that I've had um, with this illness to um, make a difference to others. Yeah, that's great. And, and as a parent, it's, it's, you know, it, it adds a whole new element to the conversation around mental health and mental illness, uh, similar to, to what everybody has said here. You know, you never... I'm grateful for my struggle, similar to what you were saying earlier, Michael. It's it's something that I'm proud of and, and something that I like to share with people. I would never wish it on any, anyone else. And bring, bringing that into perspective uh, as a father, you don't wish it on your children, but you also you're almost preparing them for for what is what is the future, right? What is what is real experience as we um, you know as they age and and you know step into the world? What does it really look like, and how to have those real conversations? Um, you know, and, and to kind of follow up, we've had this really great conversation on empathy, and we've only got a few minutes left. So, you know, I'm going to try and, and we're on a strict time limit here. I'm going to give each of you a, an opportunity, you know, maybe a 30 second little uh, elevator pitch type 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 idea to give, you know, maybe one last one last piece of advice or, or, or piece of inform information around empathy for all of our our audience out there. And Kayla, I'll start with you. So quick little summary of, of what you want to share. Oh, geez. Yeah. I think when it comes to empathy, it's just realizing, as, as we mentioned before, that sufferance and pain is universal. It's part of the human experience. So give yourself permission to hold space for that in a safe way. Um, and also know it's okay not to be okay. Uh, it makes more room for those difficult conversations. It makes more room for stamina, right? The ability to just sustain those types of conversations. And yeah, uh, that just makes more room for empathy at the end of the day. I think that's all I can think of right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of, kind of putting everybody on the spot here a little bit. Uh, Michael, over to you, go ahead. Yeah, I can get a lot of words in and cram them in in just, just 30 seconds. Uh, so I, I, I would say that one of the best things you can do to somebody is to say, I understand you. Um, but it's also really powerful to say, I don't understand you. And I, I think uh, in relationships, when it comes to mental health, people get in trouble when they believe they understand, when they really don't. Uh, and I try to tell people all the time, it's okay to say to this person that you really care about, hey, I don't understand what you're going through. And not only is it okay, but sometimes those are the most important words that you can say, because when you start to act like you understand, but you really don't, then all hell breaks loose because now all of a sudden you're saying, go for a nice walk, um, you know, for your depression. Well, you know, that shows lack of understanding. If you preface what you're saying with, I don't get it, um, then I think you're uh, a lot closer to being effective in caring about somebody. Absolutely, and, and that's something we also try and teach in mental health first aid around, don't expect to have an answer, right? Don't expect to know what to say when somebody tells you they're struggling. You know, if somebody expresses that they're, they're thinking about suicide, don't expect to know what to do in that moment. Don't expect to have an answer or advice, you shouldn't. It's just the fact that saying, I don't even, I don't even know what to say right now. I don't even know how to respond, but I want to help. I wanna be there to help if I can. And it's just not always having an answer is sometimes the best answer. Um, Sophie, over to you, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. We are so demanding. 
towards ourselves. So harsh sometimes towards ourselves. And I remember in my first meditation session, I was taught to meet my inner lover. And I was like, what, what? And you know, I laughed it off, but honestly, this is one of my greatest life lessons. How do you meet the inner lover inside you? How do you become patient, observing, tender? How do you speak to yourself with nobody's watching you? This is when it all happens. So you don't need to be saving yourself, saving others. It starts with little things, little gestures, little moments of where you actually take care of yourself and to trust that we can't do this alone. And I think the other key word is expertise. There are people who devote their lives, like Kayla, um, who are professionals, who know what they are doing, who are trained and educated, and they are all over this country. And people need to know that there's help out there, no matter where you are, living close or far to a city, you can get help. Thank you. And I honestly don't have the words to express uh, my gratitude for, for all three of you and, and sharing your experiences and your advice and just your perspective on, on what empathy is. You know, I'm very honored to be able to sit here with you today and, and to have learned from each of you. And I know, you know, based on the comments that are coming in and, and you know, them flashing on the screen here, the number of people that are extremely grateful, um, extremely inspired and, and motivated to not only learn how to be, you know, learn how to express empathy, but just to be more of an ally, you know, and, and Sophie, you said something really important at the end there. And I think that's almost the message that, that um, we want to continue to give to people. And it's that, you know, it, you're not alone and, and that there are people that want to help and, and the, there are people that care. There are people that would do anything to help you get the help you need and you don't have to do it alone. And almost, you know, most importantly, you, you're not going to be able to do it alone. You need you need support, you need allies, you need people that care, you need people that are willing to, to take that step with you and, and walk beside you or in front of you or behind you, depending on the situation. Um, and, and that's an important message to leave with everybody today. And I think, you know, as we conclude the, the event today, you know, I, I, just like all of you, I, I do these presentations quite a bit and I'm, I'm leaving here inspired. I'm leaving here feeling like I've taken a lot from this. So I can imagine that everybody that has been an, an audience and, and participant today, um, is feeling the same way. I couldn't, I can't think of a better way uh, to kick off Mental Health Week. And I think that leaves a lot of us with some things to reflect on, some things to, to, to develop and improve on. And maybe the professor in me is coming out again in every presentation I give, I leave you with the same little bit of information and a little bit of homework. And it's to check on somebody you love, check on somebody you care about. Let them know you're thinking of them because truly, that is a way of practicing empathy is letting somebody know you care, that you're worried, that, that you're there for them. And who knows, you might simply, simply be saving a life. And that's truly all it takes is that kindness, that compassion, that empathy, which we keep talking about. And that's enough to save a life every day. And we all have that power. I encourage everybody today to, to keep this conversation going. Follow the events this week by visiting your local CMHA branches website or on social media. Um, use, the, use the hashtags Get Real and Mental Health Week to spread the word about mental health and the importance of empathy. And on that, that note, I just want to say one final thank you to all of you for being involved today. That was truly incredible. Uh, I don't have the words to express how I'm feeling, but thank you so much. Um, and I hope that you all have an incredible week and an incredible Mental Health Week. Thank you, everybody. Not to be too well.